Good morning. Uh, this hearing of the Subcommittee on International Monetary Policy and Trade will come to order. Uh, opening statements uh, for the record, and without objection, all members' opening statements will be made a part of the record. Uh, subcommittee chairs and ranking minority members will be recognized for five minutes. Uh, all other members recognized for three minutes each. Uh, and we, and I will start with an opening statement. On April 2nd, 2009, the leaders of the G20 nations gathered in London to address the global financial crisis which has gripped nearly every nation in the world. The resolution put forward by the leaders was broad and far-reaching, both in its scope as measured by the actions proposed, but also in its inclusion of nations which we may have been tempted to ignore in the past. Indeed, the very fact that the meetings in London were of the G20 leaders, plus representatives from other key emerging economies and international financial institutions, is a testament to the global nature of the crises and the imperative of a global approach to the solution. But the question remains as to why, when we are faced with the deepest economic and financial crisis since the Great Depression, we should allocate time, energy, and resources to poor and emerging economies beyond our usual aid and humanitarian activities. I believe that beyond the altruistic reasons for assisting poor and emerging countries, we have strong business, economic, and geopolitical reasons to follow through on the commitments made by President Obama and the, others, and the other leaders of the G20 summit. Indeed, it is critical to note that when we are not present, either directly through bilateral assistance or indirectly through international financial institutions and multilateral development banks, others will step in to fill the void. To do nothing and look the other way is in fact to do something. When we decide to walk away from our obligations under the pretext that the crisis is too severe to help others, we open the door for others to step in and fill the void we, we create. This is not just a theoretical threat, but in fact a very real one. Institutions like the IMF and the World Bank and many others which America supports and which were mentioned as critical to global economic recovery in the G20 communique act as balanced mediums to provide countries in need with much needed resources to forestall crises while moving these same countries to more stable, more sustainable, and more peaceful paths to economic growth. This is something we should all support. We have called this hearing to follow up on the G20 resolutions endorsed by our President Barack Obama which made explicit the importance of not just providing aid to those nations and communities in the most dire need, but rather to include poor and emerging economies as full participants in any strategy to pull the global economy out of recession. The wording of the G20 communique made this explicit. The reasons for the following, the reasons for following through on the commitments made by President Obama and the other le leaders at the G20 summit in London can be broadly grouped into three categories. One, supporting American industry, two, preventing further systemic risk in global capital markets and encouraging continued sound economic reforms, and three, promoting social political stability. Addressing these issues in order, I will begin by discussing the impact on American industry. As the G20 communique stated, emerging economies have been a true engine of, economic, of global economic growth in recent past. As we saw with the Asian financial crisis of the late 1990s, when the emerging economies of Asia stalled, world economic growth stalled. When the financial crisis that struck Asian economies was resolved, the world as a whole resumed on a path of rapid economic expansion. In many ways, we face a similar crisis today on a much larger scale. As our economies have become increasingly interdependent through trade and vertical outsourcing, American producers are directly and indirectly exposed to consumers and manufacturers around the world. Driven by their rapid economic growth, emerging middle classes, and young populations eager to consume American goods and services, emerging economies have become major consumers of goods and services produced by American companies. As a result, many American companies stand to gain from our efforts to support the continued economic growth in these countries. As was the case in the Asian financial crises, restarting the engines of growth in emerging economies will be a critical component to restart our own economy here at home. Looking at the second point about preventing further systemic risk in global capital markets, it is important to revisit some important changes that occurred in the past decade or so. It has been well documented that following the Asian financial crisis and the Argentina crisis earlier this decade, 
the IMF experienced a dramatic drop in its lending activities around the world. This was in part due to what was seen as overly harsh conditionality on loans and stigma associated with turning to the IMF for a balance of payment assistance. But this was also largely due to the availability of other sources of funding for many emerging market governments. Indeed, as capital markets matured and expanded aggressively to the four corners of the world, companies and governments in emerging markets found themselves able to borrow from global banks, investment funds, and alternative investment vehicles like never before. This enabled many of these countries to pursue their economic development strategies while building up healthy reserves. While the dead stock of poor and emerging economies would, pre would previously have been constituted nearly entirely of IMF, World Bank, and other international development institutional debt, increasingly banks and investment funds accounted for a large share of that debt. This, of course, included American investors and American banks. The risk of default primarily on sovereign debt, but also by the largest companies in these emerging economies, was equally true in companies in countries that followed what would be considered sound macroeconomic e policy building up healthy reserves and investing in the development and, di and diversification of local industry. This is true because of the nature of the crises that they are facing. They are dealing simultaneously with falling demand for their exports, a steep fall in commodity prices, collapsing remittances, drastic reductions in international aid, rising domestic unemployment, and returning immigrants. Even the best prepared emergency economies cannot withstand such a confluence of negative shocks at once and risk severe balance of payment pressure. As described, many poor countries in emerging economies have implemented sound microeconomic policies in the past decade or more. This, of course, has not been universally true, but evidence abounds of countries in Africa, Asia, Eastern Europe, and Latin America in applying more conventional, trade-driven, free market policies. These countries are, have reversed long trends of nationalization of industry, choosing instead to foster entrepreneurships and competition open their economies to international trade, and put in place the foundation of good governance. To fail these nations now by not supporting their continued efforts of reform is the risk of reversing a decade of more or more of economic achievement. And finally, the social political stability. That should be on top of the mind of all nations seeking a way out of this global financial crisis. Simply put, we are at an inflection in, in, in this point in history. And our decisions in the coming weeks and months will define the, path, the future path of global economic growth and broader geopolitical events. As already explained, many poor and emerging econ economies face a perfect storm of external shocks, uh, which is putting a great strain on their economies both at the micro le macroeconomic level but also at the microeconomic level. Emerging economies and fragile democracies will be severely tested by collapsing demand and prices for their exports, rising unemployment, falling remittances, and unemployed migrants returning to their home countries. If nothing is done, these other factors will ine inevitably push some countries into civil unrest, if not outright war. It is in the interest of all peaceful nations to ensure that this is avoided. As we approach this inflection point in history and accept th that to do nothing is not an acceptable option, we now consider how our actions can set emerging countries on a path to sustainable, peaceful growth sowing the seeds of freedom and democracy in regions of the world where they have been elusive. Trade finance and rejection of protectionism are critical components of the G20 resolution, but details are lacking, and, a pres and at present a great opportunity for us to put our imprint on the nature of this recovery and the structure of future economic relations between rich and poor nations of the world. I end as uh, Frederick uh, Basti, a 19th century French economist, rightly said, when goods don't cross borders, armies will. And I yield to my good friend, uh, Mr. Miller from California. Thank you, Chairman, for holding this hearing today on implication of the G20 Leaders Summit on low-income countries and global economy. As we're seeing, nations across the world are experiencing unprecedented economic challenges as a result of the financial fallout. While low-income countries are not exposed to non-performing mortgage assets and troubled financial firms, they have been directly impacted by the overall constriction of credit and decrease in investment, employment, and demand that developed as conditions in the financial circuit continue to worsen. Many emerging economies around the globe have made significant progress in implementing financial, government, and social reforms necessary to foster stable economic growth. The development of good economic policies, especially in a bleak period, 
required great sacrifice and trade-off as its spending is scaled down. The U.S. should work to ensure that these struggling nations are successful in their pursuit of progress and their stability is not threatened because of actions and errors that occurred outside of their control. It is more important than ever to ensure that these nations continue a course of sound economic policies that will allow them to move forward, building a strong middle class and thus sustainable foundation for recovery. As we all know, terrorism respects no national border and can gravely impair the economies of nations large and small. Poverty breeds unrest and instability that creates the type of condition that allow dictators and extremists to thrive. Worsening economic conditions throughout the globe will foster terrorism and, just, and jeopardize our safety. U.S. policy should support and encourage responsible participation in a global economy in which we live. Just as low-income e countries have affected by downturns in the U.S., the U.S. Is, is impacted by downturns in emerging markets. These nations represent an ever-increasing consumer base for U.S. E exports. When they suffer economic strife, global demand diminishes and the U.S. jobs are affected as a consequence. With that, I look forward to the hearing today and further to review the subcommittees made on G20 and their April hearing. I'm looking forward to hearing the witnesses today and the input they have, and I would like to ask for the unanimous consent to recognize um, Congressman Hensling for a minute and a half. Without objection. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the committee allowing me to uh, participate. I'm not here today to have the debate about uh, how worthy the IMF may be, but I am here today to raise the question on whether or not today is the time that the United States should be committing an extra $100 billion of taxpayer money to the IMF. Uh, that's a commitment of $861 for every American household. Uh, this comes on top of $6,034 to fund the $700 billion worth of bailout money last September, $9,810 to fund the $1.13 trillion government stimulus plan, $3,534 per American household to fund a $410 billion omnibus spending plan. Uh, we are now borrowing, borrowing 46 cents for every dollar that the government spends. Uh, this Congress just passed a budget which will triple, triple the national debt in just 10 years. Uh, yesterday, we received the news uh, from the Medicare trustees, no surprise here, uh, that Medicare is going broke sooner than we had thought. It will be going flat broke in 2017, two years earlier than projected. And they tell us the unfunded liability of Medicare over a 75-year period is up an additional $1.8 trillion. At some point, I think we have to ask ourselves the question, is there any limit to the liability exposure we're willing to place on the American taxpayer? Is there any limit to the amount of debt uh, that we are willing to place on our children and our grandchildren? Uh, now, I know some will argue that for CBO scoring purposes, this shouldn't actually be scored. Uh, this is simply a, a, an asset transfer. We're just extending a $100 billion line of credit. Well, we heard the very same argument in favor of Freddie and Fannie. Uh, we were told there would never be any taxpayer liability there. Well, we kind of know how that story turned out. And if press reports are credible, uh, we understand that this request may be attached to the war supplemental. I mean, how do we explain to our constituents then uh, that Congress may be on the verge of committing more money to the IMF uh, and to foreign nations than committing to our American troops uh, in the field? Uh, that's certainly not something I care to try to explain. And when so many of our own citizens are having trouble uh, paying for uh, accessing credit to refinance their homes, their interest rates are going up on their credit cards, credit cards are being withdrawn from the market, and I believe certainly Congress has exacerbated that trend. How do we tell them that w you can't get credit, uh, but we're going to make you more exposed as a taxpayer to give foreign nations more credit? Uh, I think this is an incredibly poor time uh, to be putting an additional $100 billion of taxpayer liability exposure uh, for an additional contribution to the IMF. Uh, and again, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the indulgence of the committee for allowing me to speak, and I yield back the balance of my time. Ms. Moore of, Cali of Wisconsin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I will uh, keep my opening statement brief. I guess I'd like to build upon the comments of Mr. Hensarling uh, 
by just pointing out that the collapse of these emerging economies bodes very poorly for the United States. We will not have uh, the opportunity to export products if we allow these emerging economies to fail. Uh, and what we're trying to do, the, the financial collapse that we're all experiencing globally um, is uh, it bodes it, uh, for us to develop a sustainable world economy. And so I, while, uh, while it is uh, penny wise to uh, be protectionist and to only look out for ourselves, it is pound foolish to think that we can allow the economic collapse of uh, peoples and economies across the globe and expect that we're going to survive. So I think that the gathering of the G20 was very significant uh, in that it reinforced a truth that we're all in this together. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would yield back. Can I reclaim the balance of my time? Yes. Uh, Mr. Manzullo is on his way. He got delayed by um, some traffic, as you all saw in the hallway in this financial, in the uh, Judiciary Committee. Um, Mr. Hensling made some good points, and I, I, I don't want his, his argument to be taken um, improperly. Um, I think we have a responsibility to the American people, like Mr. Hensling said. Um, we do understand that um, when smaller countries are developing have problems, um, many times terrorists breed upon that. But I think it's um, incumbent upon us to look at all the aspects of what our government is involved in today, the amount of money we're spending, the amount of money that this type of a loan um, could benefit in the long run, too, to these emerging countries and, and to create stability um, in those sectors. And I think it's very important that we look at that. But I, I think he made some valid points. I think that's perhaps something we should, we should also address in this committee because we know um, the president is looking to try to do the right thing in many of these countries, but we're also um, in a situation where the American people are suffering and um, how the perception is taken by them as to where these dollars are invested is something I think we need to look at uh, from a sincere perspective and understand if there's really um, the positive and negative of doing what we're trying to do. And I think I could talk forever and Mr. Uh, Manzula might not show up, so I will yield back the balance <laughs> of my time. We'll allow Mr. Manzula when he does show up to, uh, to uh, have a few words right after we hear from our distinguished witnesses. And oh, just before, maybe that was Mr. Maffei. Do you have an opening statement? I'll just agree with the chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> we have some distinguished witnesses that I'm delighted to, uh, uh, to have uh, testify this morning. Uh, and, uh, and Mr. Uh, Amar uh, Bhattacharya, who is the director of the Intergovernmental Group of the 24 on International Monetary Affairs and Development, the G24. The G24 was established in 1971 as a representative body of finance ministers and central bank governors of developing countries with the objective of helping to articulate and support the position of developing countries in the discussions of the IMF, World Bank, and other relevant fora. Uh, prior to taking up his current position, Mr. Bhattacharya, uh, uh, had a long-standing career in the World Bank. His last position was as senior advisor and head of the International Policy and Partnership Group in the Poverty Reduction and Economic Management Network of the World Bank. He was advisor to the president and senior management and focal point of, for the bank's engagement with key international groupings and institutions such as the G7, G8, G20, IMF, OECD, and the Commonwealth Secretariat. Uh, he is an Indian national who completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Delhi and at Brandeis University and his graduate study at Princeton University. We also have with us Ms. Nancy Birdsall. Uh, she is the founding president of the Center for Global Development. Before launching the center, she served for three years as senior associate and director of the Economic Reform Project at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace from 1993 to 1998. She was Executive Vice President of the Inter-American Development Bank. Before joining the Inter-American Development Bank, she spent 14 years in research policy and management positions at the World Bank. 
She's the author, co-author, or editor of more than a dozen books and monographs on international development issues. Ms. Bersall holds a PhD in economics from Yale University and an MA in international relations from John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. We have Mr. Simon Johnson, is it Simon or Simone? Simon Johnson, uh, who is the Ronald A. Kurtz Professor of Entrepreneurship at MIT Sloan School of Management. He's also a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, D.C., and a co-founder of the BaselineScenario.com, a widely cited website on the global economy and a member of the Congressional Budget Office's Panel of Economic Advisors. Professor Johnson is an expert on financial and economic crises, and as an academic in policy roles with the private sector over the past 20 years, he has worked on severely stressed economic and financial situations around the world. His research and policy advice focuses on how to limit the impact of negative shocks and manage the risk faced by countries. He is co-founder and current co-chair of the National Bureau of Economics Research Project on Africa, and he's also a faculty director of MIT Sloan's New Moscow Initiative and former member of the Global Advisory Board of Endeavor, which promotes entrepreneurship in Latin America and around the world. And last but far from least, we have Mr. Timothy D. Adams, who is the managing director of the Lindsay Group. Uh, previously, Mr. Adams served as Undersecretary of Treasury for International Affairs. As Undersecretary, Mr. Adams was the administration's point person on international financial issues, including exchange rate policy, G7 meeting, and IMF and World Bank issues. He regularly interacted with counterparts in key emerging markets, including China, India, and Brazil, and traveled extensively throughout Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. Prior to assuming his post as Undersecretary, Mr. Adams had served, at, served as Chief of Staff to both Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill and Treasury Secretary John Snow. He was Policy Director for the Bush-Cheney re-election campaign from November 2003 through the end of 2004, and also served as a full-time member of the Bush-Cheney campaign staff in Austin in 2000. Uh, in 1993, Mr. Adams co-founded the G7 Group, a Washington-based advisory firm. He later headed the Washington operations as managing director. Mr. Adams holds a BS in finance and a master's in public administration and an MA in international relations from the University of Kentucky. So we have a group of distinguished wish, wit witnesses and we'll first hear from Mr. Bhattacharya. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's a, a privilege to uh, testify in front of this committee. Let me just say before we start that without objection, your written statement uh, will be made a part of the record and you will be recognized for five minutes uh, summary of your, of your testimony. Um, it is a particular privilege uh, uh, to be here given the very, very high stakes that emerging markets and developing countries have in your deliberations. Um, I want to make three points uh, based on my testimony. Uh, the first, echoing very much what has been said, is that while uh, the developing world is in many ways uh, an innocent bystander in this crisis, they can be and must be part of the solution, the global solution. Um, if you look at the record right now, there's no doubt that the crisis is having a disproportionate impact on the developing world. Uh, Unemployment, for example, in the developing world is expected to increase by maybe as much as 50 million this year. Uh, and in sub-Saharan Africa, per capita income growth is expected to decline by 2.5%, something that we haven't seen for almost two decades. So the crisis is really having a very, very serious impact. And assisting these countries is important for many of the reasons that you stressed. First, the fact that this time round the emerging markets are not amplifying the crisis is good news. And helping them to ensure that they can contain the crisis is good for us all. Second, you have to remember that the developing world now constitutes three out of the four engines of global growth. So when you think about global recovery, helping these countries get back on their feet is good for the global world. And it's very good for the United States, which has exported more than 50% of its exports to the developing world in the last three, three years. So it's in everybody's self-interest. Third, 
the very important point, Mr. Chairman, you made about social stability and peace in particularly the fragile countries and particularly the poorest countries is good for everybody in the world. The second point I want to make is that there is great urgency in giving effect to the decisions that were made by the G20, especially with regard to the resources of the IMF. Uh, as no doubt uh, Ms. Birdsall will uh, make the point that she always has, the IMF is the world's fire brigade, and we have to remember that we are in the midst of a raging fire. Since the crisis broke out, the IMF has committed 147 billion for 20 countries, including three countries under the new flexible credit line. That amounts to 60% of the available resources of the IMF, excluding the bilateral loan from Japan. There are many more countries in active discussions with the IMF, and as we know, the downside uncertainties are very large. So there is really great urgency to getting uh, agreement on this arrangements to borrow. Does that mean that the IMF should be given a blank check? The answer is absolutely no in three particular respects. First, this temporary borrowing must be seen as a bridge to a more permanent increase in quotas, and that's what the G20 committed to. Second, it must be linked with fundamental reforms in governance, governance with regard to voice and vote, in particular a shift from Europe to the developing world. Second, with regard to the selection process of the heads of the institutions. And third, with regard to conditionality. The IMF has put in place a new conditionality framework. Some will say that perhaps it's too lax. Others, like ourselves, will say perhaps it's not lax enough. But the key is that the decisions will be in the implementation. And it is important that the IMF implement it in a way that doesn't penalize the developing world and that recognizes that this crisis is exogenous. The last point I want to make is important though that increase in the IMF resources are, the area where the G20 was perhaps the least ambitious was with, with respect to the poorest countries. Yes, six billion has been put on the table, but the needs of the developing, the poorest countries, we estimate are in the order of more like 35 to 50 billion dollars. Hence, it's very important to follow through on the increase in concessional resources, not so much only for the IMF, but for the concessional arms of the multilateral development banks. At the moment, therefore, giving effect to IDA is very important, and it is simply not good enough to say we are going to front load IDA. We have to recognize that the amount of money that IDA needs now is much greater than what we had contemplated before the crisis. And so it's on that note of raising, in fact, even more the ambition of the G20, where I think this body could make a great deal of difference. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Birdsell. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman um, and Ranking Member Miller and others for your statements. I think you have all already said much uh, that's important and said it very eloquently. Uh, but let me repeat that today's challenges in our global village do not respect borders, and that's true for human security, it's true about food safety, it's true about climate change, and now it's most evidently true with respect to the financial crisis. And we are complicit in the U.S. in starting a fire, or at least contributing in a major way to a fire in the global village. We're the biggest player, and we have a responsibility to raise the resources to deal with this raging fire, particularly as it affects the low-income countries, the poorest countries in the world, and the poorest people. Uh, we also need resources for the fire department so that it is more capable and more effective in enforcing building codes in the future and other measures that will make uh, all the houses in the village more resilient uh, and less exposed to the vulnerabilities that this financial crisis has demonstrated. Let me make four points very quickly. Uh, the first is that we need the IMF, we Americans. The second, that Congress should approve the overall package the administration has requested. Uh, 
including the $100 billion uh, for the, na the uh, new arrangement to borrow facility. Congress should approve the sale of gold, and I'd be happy to answer questions beyond what I say orally on how that gold should be, those resources should be allocated. And Congress should ensure that the uh, governance reforms are um, uh, go ahead, that Treasury is urged to push on those. Uh, two reasons why Americans need the IMF, I think Amar Bhattacharya has also said very nicely, as have you. The first is that our own economic recovery does depend heavily on economic recovery in emerging markets and in other developing countries. And the second has to do with development more generally. Um, both the Bush administration and the Obama administration have said that our foreign policy relies on a three-legged stool, defense, diplomacy, and development. And the IMF can and must play a critical role in ensuring that the development leg with U.S. leadership is not weakened further than it already is. That has to do with uh, insecurity, instability. Uh, it has to do with protecting the incredible progress most developing countries have made in the last decade in reforming their own governance, reducing corruption, managing their own macroeconomic matters much more effectively, and so on. So that's my first point. The second point is that the U.S. should agree to a loan of $100 billion to the IMF. Congressman Hensingling raised the question whether this would increase risks for Americans. And the answer is essentially that it would not. This is a credit to an institution that is extraordinarily sound, that follows extraordinarily conservative policies. Uh, this is not in my written testimony, but I'm saying it in response to his query, that there is absolutely no way to compare the situation of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac prior to this crisis in terms of its soundness to that of the International Monetary Fund today. There is no way that the taxpayers could be said to really be taking any reasonable risk in this kind of transfer, in effect transfer of assets between uh, the United States and the IMF. In addition, I support the idea of an additional $250 billion of SDRs that are being created uh, as called for at the G20 summit in London, and I urge the Congress to en endorse heartily this move. I believe the administration has made the necessary notification to the Congress in order to go ahead with that part of um, changes at the IMF. Third point, the Congress should endorse the sale of IMF gold for two purposes. Uh, I urge this subcommittee to uh, push for approval of those gold sales and to provide guidance to Treasury for its discussions with other IMF members on the allocation of the sales revenue between the two purposes. The one purpose being for the endowment at the IMF that would strengthen the fire department functions, and the second purpose being for additional resources for the low-income countries. I think on the issue of additional resources for the low-income countries, the key issue is actually timing, and the Congress faces, the Senate now also faces the question of how urgently to move. Uh, my concern would be that it's important to move quickly to exercise U.S. leadership and to insist that the Treasury take steps to insist on the, the associated reforms that we have been talking about. I have comments on how the, uh, the concessional resources should be used by the IMF, where this subcommittee may want to um, lend its guidance. And one of those comments has to do with, if possible, using the resources for grants to minimize future debt. And a second uh, has to do with ensuring that the IMF uses those resources in exactly the same way in effect for standby type loans, as it does in the case of middle income countries, the only difference being in the charges it um, charges. And finally, um, the Congress should push for faster and further governance reform at the IMF. It is in our direct national security and economic interests 
to make the IMF not only better resourced, but a more credible and effective global financial institution. That's only possible if China and other major emer emerging market economies have a much larger role in IMF decision making, are brought into the process and become also uh, shepherds um, of the global economy. So the G20 leaders recognized this at the summit in April and the call for additional resources for the IMF where the U.S. did take leadership is twinned, and again the U.S. has been a leader, smartly with calls for governance reform. You've heard a lot about the governance reform already today. You'll hear more about them. I believe that despite the shortcomings of the current reform process, it's now sensible to go ahead with the overall package, including those governance reforms, with a lot of guidance from this committee and from the, your committee and from the Senate to the Treasury on how insistent the U.S. should be in pushing for even faster uh, implementation of the reform and pushing for the next round to be less modest and more deep. Let me conclude by th saying that the IMF is far from perfect. There have been a lot of concerns from many people over the years, but in the last couple of years, the IMF has made substantial progress um, in implementing uh, a better approach to conditionality, in beginning the reform process on the governance side. It's going in the right direction, and at this point, I think the urgency we should all face is the need for the additional resources to be put at the IMF. Um, I urge the Congress, the House, and the Senate, therefore, to move quickly on the necessary legislation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by emphasizing one, one piece of my uh, bio I'm not sure was mentioned, which is I was the chief economist at the IMF until the end of August. And uh, as a result, was, um, have a particular perspective on both their view of the global economy and, and um, the, the issues of uh, IMF uh, reform. I'm on the record as being strongly in support of the IMF on some dimensions, but certainly not on, on all uh, dimensions. And I'd like to break that, my agreements and disagreements, into, into three pieces. Speak, let me speak briefly about the global economy and, and the summit, what, uh, the context of this discussion, and, and then spend a little bit more time on the proposals that are coming before you. So first of all, on the global economy, I, I broadly agree uh, with, with the, the numbers put forward, the summary nicely by, by Mr. Bhattacharya. I actually think that the IMF uh, baseline, uh, which is regarded as being fairly negative in the context of overall global economic forecasts, to my mind is a little too optimistic. And if you read between the lines and you look at the way the report is presented, there's a lot of discussion there of downside scenarios. Um, believe me, these are not scaremongers at the IMF. These are very sensible professional people. They are warning you in no uncertain terms that while the global economic situation has stabilized to some degree, there, are, there is substantial potential for things to get worse. And uh, I, I think that um, the chairman's uh, opening statement about social stability are absolutely critical in that context. That is exactly how um, the, the economy can worsen. We've seen many economic shocks we're seeing a lot of the hits on f the world's poorest people just now coming through, and we haven't yet seen the full social and political impact of that. So I, I think the, the, the global situation is e extremely dangerous. Secondly, and, and speaking directly to that, I think the G20 summit was, was a remarkable success. I think a, in large part this was due to the efforts of the Obama administration. It was a come from behind win. The previous G20 summit, uh, which was held in Washington at the end of last year, was a severe disappointment. And the Obama administration rightly focused on, on certain key issues which they felt they could win. The central, most important one, of course, or set of issues is around the IMF. And within the IMF context, the most important issue was, was money. How much money does the IMF have to lend, have available to lend, if times get tough, if the downside scenario materializes? And you need a lot. If it, the downside scenario is very, very bad in this context. We, we don't, I called back in the fall for the IMF to have $2 trillion available to lend. This was when the IMF had $250 billion total. And that call, I think, was regarded as somewhat exaggerated. Well, now the IMF is going to have, if, if the full set of um, funding proposals and uh, special drawing rights allocation goes through, they'll have about a $1 trillion available to lend. I regard that as a very sensible step in the right direction, but I'm still not sure that's enough. 
this is a very big world with a lot of interconnected problems and many things can still go wrong. The IMF is the fire brigade, as Nancy Birdsell uh, has stressed repeatedly, and Larry Summers uh, is also stressing. And the fire departments um, are essential and you don't want to start from scratch and rebuild in the middle of a crisis, but you do want to make sure they're credible, legitimate, and they have the resources they need to, to fight the fires. And that's the context in which I support the additional resources for the IMF. In fact, I would go further, and if Mr. Consoling comes back in, I'd be happy to discuss that with him directly. But at the same time, I would stress and absolutely emphasize in every context the need to continue and follow through the so-called process of IMF reform. I put a long list of items that need to be addressed in my written statement, but let me close by emphasizing three of them. First of all, the process of selection for the next managing director of the IMF must be an open competition. You must look for, they must look for, and Treasury, you should impress upon Treasury the importance of following through with this declaration of the G20 that the, the next managing director of the IMF cannot be a European. It has always been a European since the end of sec the Second World War. There is no good reason for this. It, has per it, it is regarded in some quarters as having become a sinecure. That is not what you need for the top position of the world's leading financial fire, de fire department. Uh, it, it, I think that the leaders agreed to change that, uh, and I think it's most, most important to make sure there's no backsliding on that whatsoever. Um, anything less than that, I think, will be regarded with derision and scorn around the world, and it'll further undermine uh, the credibility and hamper the rebuilding of legitimacy of the IMF. Second, in terms of IMF resources, there, is, there has been an unconscionable gap, if I may use a technical term, the IMF was forced to cut its budget a year ago. This was a process that had been long in the making, and we can go back and, and argue about whether it was right or wrong uh, at the time the decisions were made. But the point is, it was implemented just as the global crisis was beginning to become more severe, and as the IMF itself was warning about that, the fire department was cut back. You have five fire engines, and then you're told to go to three, and you're saying, the forest fire is coming. And they say, no, actually go to two and a half fire engines. That's crazy. It's irresponsible. That budget must be reversed. The IMF has plenty of cash on hand. The IMF is earning money from its loans. It's earning money from its new flexible credit facility, uh, which has the potential also to generate revenue during stable times as well as unstable times. The IMF staff levels must be returned at least to the level they were at at the end of 2007. You cannot reasonably and responsibly call on the IMF to do the job that the G20 is asking to do with the reduced level of resources. It's just not serious. Thirdly, and finally, the job of exchange rate surveillance is absolutely central. This responsibility has traditionally been, one w been with the IMF, and particularly because of issues around the undervaluation of the Chinese exchange rate over the fi past five to eight years, is it become more severe. The IMF has unfortunately, for reasons we can discuss separately if, if you're interested, dropped the ball on this issue. You cannot rebuild confidence in the global system. You cannot persuade developing countries to cooperate fully and not to try and run big current account surpluses, accumulate lots of reserves and undervalue their currencies and take jobs away from America and generate resentment among your constituents unless and until somebody manages the exchange rate system properly. This is how the flow of trade, the flow of goods across border breaks down and this is how the flow of soldiers across borders starts with this kind of mismanagement. So the IMF reform process must be completed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Miller and the members of this committee. Uh, for the sake of brevity and avoid duplication, I'll be quite, uh, quite quick. I agree with, uh, with uh, Dr. Johnson that the global environment, the global economy remains very fragile. <coughs> and as he mentioned, I think he used the phrase extremely dangerous. I think that is an, an accurate description of economic conditions. Two, let me say that I agree with the G20 agenda that was laid out in London April 2nd. <clears throat> I too applaud the President for his leadership at, at that summit uh, and for helping shape the outcome of the, of the G20 meeting. Uh, I also fully endorse the subcomponent of that agenda which is directly focused on the IMF. <clears throat> there have been times where I've been a harsh critic of the fund but I think uh, pr even prior to this crisis, but certainly in this crisis, <coughs> they should be applauded for their creativity, their imagination, and the speed with which they have jumped into the trenches to try to craft new programs and, and retool old programs to meet the changing nature of this crisis and to be relevant uh, given the nature of this crisis. But 
I, I, I'd want to address the, the, the point that the Congress made earlier about why do we want to do this? It is a tremendous amount of money. We're spending a lot of money. We're going to the, as one of my old bosses once said, to the plumbers and carpenters of Chicago and asking them to spend more of their hard-earned money and send it to Washington. Uh, why should we do that? And I, I know for a number of reasons. Uh, one is because we need, to, we, need, we need to reward good performers. We need to send signals to countries that, that taking the political risk of, of, of doing the right thing on policy, it will be rewarded and they should continue doing it in the future. I strongly think that incentives matter. So it's an important signaling effect to all those countries out there that have done the right thing over the past five or 10 years. Two, it's in our national security interest without question. If you look at some of the countries that the fund has provided additional assistance to, Pakistan, 170 million people in a very fragile economy that appears more perilous by the day. Uh, we should do everything in our power. I know that Congress is even looking at bilateral assistance. We should do everything in our power to help countries like Pakistan remain a stable, vibrant democracy uh, as part of our overall national interest. And there are other countries that receive support. Colombia, which is on the front lines of, of fighting narco-terrorism, Mexico, which is an important uh, partner and, and with which we share a border in, in, many, uh, in many challenges. The Ukraine, which is uh, a waypoint for Russian uh, um, energy into Europe. Europe's energy security depends on the gas that flows across uh, Ukraine. And I can only imagine that if there is political turmoil in Ukraine, might our friends in Moscow decide to redrop the, redraw the map of Europe. Uh, a place like Tajikistan, which relies on a tremendous amount of remittances for its, uh, for its budget. 45% uh, remittances account for 45% of the GDP of Tajikistan. Why is it important? Because it's a, it's a northern waypoint of uh, terrorist, terrorist resources, and those hostile to the United States to gain entry into Afghanistan where our, our men and women in uniform are dying every single day. And it is also a through point for poppy uh, and for opium to find its way out. Uh, most of it goes to Europe, but some of it ends up in the streets of the United States. It's in our national interest, to, to sh national security interest to ensure the stability of fragile states everywhere. Uh, thirdly, it's in our economic interest. Some of the statistics that were noted, uh, I just want to uh, reemphasize because I think they're important. Uh, Sixty percent uh, U.S. exports since 2004 have grown at three times the pace uh, to emerging markets. Have grown at three times the pace to the developed markets, uh, and that's grown at 60 percent uh, since 2004. Ninety-five percent of the world's population reside outside the, UA the U.S., and 98 percent of population growth between now and mid-century will occur in uh, developing and emerging markets. It's where the middle class is growing. It is consumers for U.S. goods and services. And the IMF estimates that non-advanced economies will account for 70% of global growth over the next five years. Our economic future is tied to the prosperity and stability of the emerging and developing world, without question. Uh, fourthly, we should re reward institutional reform. It goes back to the same point I made earlier about uh, countries. The IMF is reforming itself, it is changing, it needs to do more. We all have uh, a number of suggestions on how it could do a better job, but we should reward that behavior. Institutional change and in international organizations come in frequently, and I, I, I applaud the fund for the changes they're making. And lastly, this is an important time for U.S. leadership. I spend a tremendous amount of time traveling around the world, and everywhere I go, there is a belief that somehow U.S. power is on the descent, that U.S. values, U.S. principles, uh, are uh, are no longer relevant, that we live in a multipolar world, that the possibly the Beijing agenda will become paramount or on the ascendancy. The U.S. needs to maintain its important leadership role in the, in the global economy. So let me just conclude by saying I strongly endorse the G20's agenda. I strongly endorse the IMF component, and I would strongly urge this committee, this House, and this Congress to move as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, and I think that you've given us all some, some, some food for thought. Let me uh, start out by asking a uh, series of, of, of questions. The, the G20 agreed that the new arrangements to borrow should be expanded by $500 billion, And we've talked about and we've heard some 
uh, and this is the topic uh, that's among many of us here, that the Obama administration has proposed that the United States participate in this plan by extending uh, $100 billion uh, uh, line of credit to the IMF through the uh, NAB. Now, the G20 also said that the enhanced NAB would be a more flexible, quote unquote, uh, in its operations, though it's not clear what flexible means, uh, you know, what, what's proposed by flexibility and what might be entailed therein. Uh, so my questions are, have the terms for access and use of the current NAB been too restrictive first? And if you think so, how might they be improved? Um, should Congress require the administration to provide it with the ground rules for the new enhanced NAB before it goes into effect? These are decisions that we've got to decide. And are there any ground rules that you believe Congress should mandate for U.S. participation in the new NAB program? And so I throw those out to you first. And any, anyone can jump at it who wants. Um, the uh, NAB of the past uh, was essentially a fairly complicated uh, legal instrument, as we understand it, which restricted in some many ways the speed and the flexibility of the use of resources. Uh, so when the new Japanese loan, which is 100 billion, was negotiated, the IMF and Japan agreed to several improvements that would allow for considerable flexibility in the use of the Japanese money in association with programs that are, were put in place. And the aim is to move towards a more multilateral uh, version of that through the new uh, arrangements uh, tomorrow. Uh, as I said, the only other point I would make, though, is that this is a temporary arrangement and there must be a balance between the temporary arrangement and the permanent size of the fund. It would seem unseemly to have temporary arrangements of twice the size of the, of the fund. So a very important part of the conditions that I was saying is that there must be a bridge to an agreement to increase the permanent size of the fund through quota increases. Now that is in the G20 agreement that, that should, would be done by January. And that's something that could be part of the guidance that could be given. The other part of the guidance on the NAB, of course, is that it must be linked to some of the governance reforms that many of us were talking about. Um, my, my view would be that uh, the relevant issue in terms of flexibility is associated not only with the NAB but with the operations of the IMF in general. And here I think what's useful to recognize is that the IMF has been going through a process of reform in terms of streamlining and reducing conditionality for some years. And that recently with the uh, agreement on what's called a flexible credit line, the IMF has finally set up an instrument. It's only available to a limited number of countries that have a record of good macro policy but it's going in the right direction. It allows countries to have access to resources when they need those resources uh, without really paying much, if anything, until they uh, actually ask for those resources. A number of countries, as mentioned, Mexico, Poland, um, have already applied for this flexible credit line, which is a very good sign that there's something about the way this was set up that is reducing the, the domestic political problem that many leaders faced within countries because of the stigma of going to the IMF. I think there are other issues around the NAB that are specific, such as other countries being able to contribute than were originally. So I'm not sure, frankly, what the leadership meant by more flexible, but I do think that the Congress should emphasize the need for the Treasury in implementing uh, lending in the future from the IMF, particularly in the light of the Congress, to in the light of the crisis, to be more flexible and to push in the direction it's been taking already. Here's a difficulty, and, and then I'll let you, Mr. Johnson, then I'm going to yield to my Senate Ranking Member, Mr. Miller. But 
And I think and, and what, what I've heard bo both of you say thus far is that everyone agrees that there needs to be some kind of reform and you know we've got to move and s though progress is starting to happen, we still know that reform is generally slow. And what I've also heard from many who've come before me is the urgent need, and I've heard, I think I'm hearing some of that from you, of the recapitalization of the IMF and the World Bank and other institutions. There's a trade-off, though. You know, we are pressured here in Congress talking about there has to be reform, and then there's an urgency for um, um, recapitalization. How does that trade-off play? You know, and that's the difficulty I think some of us will have uh, in deciding which way we go uh, on this committee and in this Congress. I think to, to answer your original question, you sh the tre Treasury should come and explain to you much more precisely what they, what they have in mind with regard to the flexibility. They're obviously just one voice at the table, but they're a very important voice at the IMF. I think part of, the more flex part of the flexibility we're seeing around the flexible credit line is sensible, but it's a pretty small step. Only three countries so far have signed up. I think you need at least a dozen to really establish the credibility of that. And secondly, around conditionality, some of, the, some of the progress we're seeing, for example, protecting social spending is very sensible and long overdue. But some of the retreat from structural conditionality is, I think, a mistake. And so there's a lot of details getting lost in, 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 in the translation here between um, the various uh, statements that you really need to, to follow up on and, get and pin down Treasury on exactly what they have in mind. Mr. Chairman, let me just add that I, I, don't, I think it's very important to recognize that this kind of hearing in itself helps create the right kind of benign pressure, both on the administration and the Treasury and indirectly on IMF management and staff and board. So my view is that the direction is right and that it's very important to continue providing a lot of guidance to Treasury on the position the U.S. should be taking on increasing this flexibility while retaining, as I say in my written testimony, uh, the rationale behind some conditionality in some, at some times in some settings. The point is that right now we have a global economic emergency and uh, this is the time to, to provide the resources and to be sure that those, res those use resources are used as quickly and urgently as particularly the poor countries need them. It is useful also to push for the idea of something like the flexible credit line being um, made available to low-income countries. At the moment, that uh, facility is really meant for middle-income emerging market economies. There should be something absolutely comparable, with the exception of the cost, for the poorest countries. Many of them meet the standard in terms of macroeconomic management and, and good governance that uh, some emerging market economies have met. Mr. Miller. Thank you. I think it's incumbent on us to demonstrate to the American people that we're trying to do the right thing. And as you all recognize, we're in most unusual times for this country. We have a budget deficit of about a trillion eight hundred and thirty billion dollars. It's I mean it's staggering when you look at that. And and in California, specifically we have an unemployment rate of about eleven point two percent. And in the Inland Empire region of our area, which has been an economic engine for California, it's actually in excess of twelve percent. And it's actually greater than that in reality because you figure one out of six people work for government and government unemployment is virtually zero. So when you add that number to the equation, unemployment amongst the private sector is really much greater than the 11.2 percent in California than, than the, they show out there. Now if we're going to commit $100 billion to the IMF, how do we ensure that these resources are being used to address economic stability and assist in our global economic recovery. How do we show that that is going to be done? Can you try to address that? Because there's, there's great concern about that. I'm sorry, was that addressed to any of us? Yes, whoever would like to. Uh, I mean, this, it's a lot of money, especially during our economic times. And you've, you've justified a great need, and you demonstrated how that need will benefit the overall you know, developing countries as well, but how do we ensure the resources are being used to address stability? How can we guarantee that? I'll, I'll take a crack at it, Congressman. First of all, it's, this is an insurance policy. It's a contingent line of credit, so it's only used if called upon, and it is, uh, Dr. Britzel noted, it is for the best performers, those who have achieved a certain level of 
of performance standards that I think are pretty rigorous. So it is for those who have done the right thing, who have been good performers, uh, and uh, for no fault of their own, they are the collateral damage, suffering the collateral damage of, of a crisis, which in some ways really started here in the United States. Uh, two, as I was just looking at uh, a report from J.P. Morgan put out yesterday that said, strong uh, uh, IFI support, international financial institution support, appears to be working to address the fears of extreme balance of payments, tail risks in emerging markets. So there's a sense that just the signaling effect of the desire to use these resources and have these new resources, it in fact is having a stabilizing impact on global markets. So in some ways it's already begun working. We just have to ensure that the resources are there to support this signaling effect. But I think it goes back to an early po uh, uh, earlier point. There's greater flexibility for managing these programs, which I think are important, but the Treasury will have to, uh, uh, will have, to uh, have appropriate oversight and this body will have to hold uh, the Treasury Department accountable for these actions, too. But you used a real term out there that the economy recognizes right now, and you said line of credit. And I can name business after business, industry after industry, that normally had lines of credit that had been completely terminated because of the economy today, to no fault of their own. Um, they've done the right thing. They've tried to pay their bills. They're, many are current. But the lines of credit that they need to continue um, their business have been terminated just because the industry is so questionable. So uh, although it's a line of credit, I recognize that, but the American people are looking at that as, as hard dollars because that's what lines of credit are. They're, if you need the money, it's going to be there. And we just need to demonstrate to the American people that their global recovery is going to benefit them in us making that investment. So if the other three would like to respond to that, I'd really appreciate it. And I'm not arguing, yeah, don't get no, me wrong. I, I'm just, I think we've got, a, we've got a level we must meet as elected officials to say we're doing the right thing with these type of dollars. Yeah, I, I want to just put it in perspective in terms of uh, the original sin. Uh, th there was, there's been a withdrawal of something like a trillion dollars of finance from the developing world uh, through no fault of their own. Uh, so this is a tsunami of gargantuan proportions. And the money that is being used is really not money in some sense uh, you know, to, to make up for some fault of theirs. It's essentially a firewall to ensure that the crisis doesn't get deeper in that part of the world. And that helps in, at a moment of extreme fragility and confidence. You don't want other sources of worries to come up. And by preventing it, you are helping us all. And you're not going to use that money in these cases, as, as was pointed out, with much risk. There are some other cases, which are the more difficult cases, for example, some countries in Eastern Europe, which are facing somewhat more difficult circumstances. So what are the protections there? And as uh, Ms. Birdsall pointed out, the IMF is a very conservative institution. It may be the lender of uh, last resort in some ways, but it is also the lender that gets paid back first. And that's been the track record. So this is relatively smart use of very limited money to produce a world in which we can climb out of this crisis in a way that manages the risks and manages the spillovers from it. The part where you really do need some generosity is for the poorest countries, but that's a very different part of the equation from the NAM. And, and I really appreciate that comment. You, you said they, they're in a situation due to no fault of their own. And see, we have to justify what we're doing to American people who've lost their jobs due to no fault of their own. And so I know $100 billion with what we're trying to do may seem like a paltry amount, but to real people in this country, that's a lot of money. And Ms. Bursa, I know you had the response to Mr. Johnson, then I will go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate the, a point made earlier in a slightly different way, that in 2008, uh, the U.S. economy grew very little, if at all. Virtually all of <coughs> our growth in 2008 was associated with our exports, with the increases in our exports. And a substantial amount of those exports went to developing countries. So I think that that makes, that is an argument, I hope, that can help make sense to uh, even those American businesses that have had their own lines of credit uh, terminated that 
to the extent that jobs in the U.S. depend in part on ensuring there is this firewall that prevents the rest of the world from sinking further into difficulty and, and not having the wherewithal to purchase our own exports, we are better off to deal with uh, the fires everywhere. Yeah. I, I, I recognize what you said about the exports. Many people think that their jobs were also exported to other countries, and that's a difficult thing for them to understand. But now, Mr. Johnson. I, would, uh, I think the way you're framing the question is entirely appropriate, and I, I would suggest two answers. First of all, the United States has a veto, and there is no major decision that the IMF can make without the United States' approval and agreement. And the IMF is located two blocks from the White House for a reason. Okay. No, this is very important. It, it's absolutely yeah. the way the IMF operates, the way the IMF thinks is very much related to and, and, and influenced by what the, what the administration is doing. And that's why you need to understand what Treasury wants them to do because Treasury is not, the, they're not calling all the shots, but they have a huge driving influence there. And the second thing is more, much more bluntly than exports, the, the, the price you pay on your credit uh, as, a, as an American business, the risk premium that is demanded for, on, on, from, from all of us whether we want to borrow against our mortgages, determi is determined by the level of risk in the global financial market. It's a global financial market. Right now, the major risks, not just according to the IMF, but according to everybody who looks at this seriously, major risk is, is outside the United States. The U.S., if it was just up to the U.S., we'd be on, beginning to get on our way to a decent recovery. It's the instability in emerging markets and, frankly, in Western Europe that's really the big danger here. And that comes back and hits every household and every firm in the U.S. smack in the face if it goes wrong. Thank you for your thoughtful answers. Ms. Moore. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I certainly uh, feel very grateful to this distinguished panel for uh, visiting with us today. Mr. Chairman, are we going to have more than one round of questions? Well, I see that we have votes coming up. So, okay. Uh, All right. So I have to pick I and like choose. I would like to have more I'm than one round. Okay. Mr. Uh, I, I guess one of the first things that is my time is limited. Um, so I will, I want to straighten something out between Ms. Birdsall and Mr. Johnson. Uh, I heard you, Ms. Birdsall, say that we needed to uh, continue governance reforms at the IMF and China should be brought in. Um, but I also noted from Mr. Johnson's testimony that the IMF credibility has been damaged by our inability to follow through on the exchange rate surveillance, particularly with, with regard to China, and that, uh, that uh, these uh, uh, competitive devaluations or even accidental undervaluations um, uh, will lead to greater global imbalances and potential instability uh, as countries compete to get current account surpluses over other countries, and I guess I need a little bit more appreciation for um, for this. I think these um, this undervaluation of currency, particularly in China, and the fact that they ought to be brought in really is something that I've been struggling with for, for a long time. So I appreciate having your expertise today to address that. Uh, Yes, let me try to address that and see if Simon wants to add to what I say. Um, he's absolutely right. I, I don't disagree at all with the point he's making, which is, can be put this way, that the IMF has been relatively toothless, uh, unfortunately, in addressing the global imbalance, which I would characterize in simple terms as follows. The Chinese are doing all the saving and exporting, and the U.S. has been doing all the borrowing and importing. So the global imbalance was uh, an out the outcome of difficulties and poor arrangements both in China and in the U.S. And the reality is that the IMF, unfortunately, despite its warnings, it's not as though there, were not, there was not written down uh, from time to time by the staff and by management um, an explication of this problem, it's difficult to discipline major powers. So it's in the interests of the U.S. to have China at the table and to be engaged more and more in the discussions of how our behavior and China's behavior create risks for all of the rest of the world. Uh, it's not going to be perfect ever but my own view is that we need, in addition to 
clubs and networks where countries get together. We need to bring as many countries that are powerful, like ourselves and like China, into institutions where ca they can be subject to uh, and make themselves subject to rules of the game and honor those rules. That makes everyone better off, both Americans and those in the rest of the world. I don't know if Simon would put it differently. <laughs> yes, uh, I would put it slightly differently, although I broadly agree that there is, of course, a major difference between the United States and China, which the United States has a floating, flexible exchange rate in which we don't intervene on a systematic basis, whereas the Chinese exchange rate is, for all intents and purposes, a fixed managed exchange rate, which means that uh, if they want to keep, if they, if they f fall into an undervalued situation for whatever reason and they wish to remain there, they have to accumulate the process of keeping that exchange rate undervalued means they will accumulate a large amount of foreign reserves. And what has happened is they've uh, amassed almost $2 trillion of reserves. Now, I'm not saying this is the main driver of the crisis. I am saying that it, it has undermined the IMF's inability to deal with this, undermined the credibility. But going forward, think of it like this. Every emerging market and, and developing country that has this potential thinks, wow, I'd love to have $2 trillion equivalent for my size of country. That's clearly a big stabilizer for me individually. At the level of the system, that's a huge destabilizer. The only way you can have more accumulation of reserves, more current account surpluses, if somebody's running a deficit, well, that might be the United States, it might be the Eurozone, whoever it is, it's not gonna be um, a stabilizing force. You need countries to buy into the system, you need a governance change, you need re-legitimization. I, I advocate an emerging market person to head the, the IMF next time the job comes up, which I think will be quite soon, because okay. you must have some teeth on the exchange rate surveillance. Okay, so is this part of the reform that is occurring at the IMF now? Uh, what ability do they have to enforce this? See, my time is expiring and I... Let, just let's finish up the question and then I want to make sure we get to Mr. Manzullo if we have time, and then we'll come back around if we have time before the vote. Is, is this a, a reform that the IMF is undergoing, and is, is it, how do, how do they get this um, club, this Billy Club, to enforce it? You know, what I would say at the moment that the most important thing is for the IMF to have the as additional sufficient resources so that the countries that the other emerging market economies see collective insurance as the, they can count on the IMF. They do not need to build up their reserves. They do not need to abandon flexible exchange rates. Uh, and th the same you might be said for China, which is trying now to increase domestic demand. Uh, it has a very big stimulus package. So, you know, you could argue that it's <laughs> in maybe not enough, but it's moving in the right direction. But it, none of these countries will go to a, a position where it works o for the overall global economy unless they are reassured that they have some place to go in the event of a shock. So what we want is collective insurance instead of all this self-insurance, which uh, contributed to the imbalance, which in turn cre contributed to our current problem. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, this was a very important question, but it prevented me from asking some other questions, so I hope there's another round. Hopefully we get a chance to come back around. Mr. Manzullo. Uh, thank you very much. I have a, a question to ask you, Ms. Birdsell, and then uh, the Kirk is passing out a document that was agreed to the Global Plan for Recovery and Reform on 2 April 2009 at the, at the G20. Uh, you had mentioned in your testimony, you said, quote, no way U.S. taxpayers would be taking a risk. Um, the, uh, the issue here is that the Congressional Budget Office on the initial draw of $100 billion uh, is unable to score it at this point, uh, either the full cost uh, or as opposed to a zero score, which the White House uh, had requested. Uh, but it's true, is it not, that if these nations default on these loans, that the default runs up the line and that the American taxpayers could end up losing some money. Uh, I don't know if others can speak more effectively to this point, but were those borrowers to default on the IMF, the IMF does have the resources to pay back the line of credit to the U.S. Then is that the reason why, the, why they would sell the gold? For example, in addition to the current plan, gold right. fails, they could 
call on other assets. Simon's probably better. Well, on I, I, I want to go to something else, and we can come back to that. If that's okay. I, I just, I just, we just passed out uh, this document, the Global Plan for Recovery and Reform. Are, are you folks familiar with this? The document that was signed yes. uh, or agreed to at the G20. And if you take a look at paragraph 15 on the third page, it talks about establishing a new financial stability board with a strengthened mandate and that it should collaborate, bullet point two, with the, collaborate with the IMF to provide early warning of financial risks. But then in the next bullet point says, uh, to extend regulation and oversight to all systemically important financial institutions, markets, and instruments. Uh, this includes, for the first time, systemically important hedge funds. The fourth bullet point is to endorse and implement the FSF's tough new principles on pay and compensation and to support support sustainable compensation schemes and the corporate social responsibility of all forms. Uh, this is perhaps why the European Central Bank came out and attacked the infusion of $100 billion into the IMF uh, and why they called it uh, possibly containing the seeds of a global currency in its own right. W what does this document uh, intend to do? I mean, what's the purpose of it? It, it specifically mentions the the 250 billion new allocation in paragraph five. Uh, Congressman, it, it, obviously it's a product of a committee, so it, it, it represents enormous compromise. On the, with respect to the Financial Stability Board is a, is a recognition of the work of the, the former f Financial Stability Forum, of which when I was a treasurer, right. I actually participated in. So that right. is just, that is giving it formal recognition and as a body to coordinate and and share best practices among and between the regulators. But it says to extend regulation and oversight to all systemically important financial institutions, instruments, and markets, and also tough new principles on pay and compensation. Isn't this an international standard to determine the pay and compensation of banks, of that may be parties, uh, banks whose countries are parties to the G20? Well, I, I, I can't speak to this particular, I, I don't know the origin or the, the negotiations that went to this. Uh, no, I'm, I'm I think the idea was, was again, to try to uh, create an environment where you could exchange ideas. No, I understand that, I understand that, but one of the statements made uh, from, from Ms. Birdsell was, uh, quote, we need to bring the big countries together to, quote, Make the make them subject to the rules of the game. To make this to make this um, uh, illegal document binding upon the G20 countries. No, I think she meant, and I'll let her speak for herself. But it's a phrase that we've used before with respect to exchange rate surveillance. Is within the funds you have a sense of the rules of the game of what is appropriate behavior and what is not appropriate behavior and what what will the institution, the fund specifically, accept as appropriate behavior with particular reference to foreign exchange. Uh, no, I, so so you, were, you were referencing just foreign exchange rules and not uh, binding IMF rules and regulations upon the countries that are signatories to the, uh, to the IMF. Is that correct? I certainly was not endorsing the, what is in this April statement from the, the summit, which, as Tim Adams was suggesting, is the outcome of, of a number of compromises. My understanding is that these sorts of uh, principles dealing with compensation schemes, probably that was a position taken by, not by the United States, by this administration necessarily. But the idea is that there would be principles. I think that there's been no agreement, however, amongst the G20 leaders ref that could be said to be reflected in this statement. Well, I, I understand that. There would be international rules imposed on all members. But, but don't you think that this is pretty shocking that this, that this agreement uh, should, be, should be literally endorsed by the G20, Spain, the signatories to the FSF, uh, that attempts to set an international standard for compensation uh, to financial institutions, markets, and, um, and instruments? Well, I think it says new principles. Yeah, go ahead, Simon. Uh, sorry, I, I don't think it's shocking at all. I th the point is, and this is, I think, exactly what the committee is, is trying to get at, which is that the global financial st system has become unstable. 
No, I understand. You don't so think they're, that they're, try they're trying to address this and they're trying to establish no, I understand a that, Mr. Chancellor. A you don't think that will, that will re reduce that instability. But you don't think it's shocking that an international body would attempt to control the, the salaries of executives of financial institutions uh, whose countries are members of the G20. You don't consider that to be shocking? I don't think they're trying to, s to, control, the, to con control the compensation levels at all. What they're trying to do is address the issue, which has been raised by the financial industry itself in this country and in Europe, that there is unnecessary, excessive, and mismanaged risk-taking in the largest financial well, that's not that's, that's, not what this big that's not what the bullet point says. The gentleman's time has expired, and we have a vote going on. Uh, so let me take this time to thank this distinguished panel. Uh, I tell you, on behalf of this uh, subcommittee, I think that your testimony was excellent uh, and very thought-provoking. Uh, I look forward to working with you uh, in the future as this committee continues to delve into uh, the issues uh, that you've talked about, and I think uh, in more detail, especially the plight of the least developed countries of the world and, uh, and how we can help uh, those economies in dealing with some of the social political realities. Uh, uh, let me note that some members may have additional questions for this panel, which they may wish to submit in writing. Uh, without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 30 days for members to submit written questions to these witnesses and to place their responses in the record. And at this time, this hearing stands adjourned.